Well, I. Um, you know what? If if you want to just hold on a second, let me lower this. Once um once we get through these slides, if you want me to just keep running at my cam, and that way you can yeah. just on the next slide and stuff. Yeah, that works. Just What's going on. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, good. This is our um, next step in our clinical faculty development series, and we're excited to have Jen Kogan here today to talk about evaluating clerkship teachers. Um, and we have a bunch of slides that we typically run through real quick. Um, we do have CME credit for these things through the University of North Carolina, um, and you don't need to worry about doing anything because I take, um, take attendance of who all's here, and then that way I can submit it to their office and they will contact you afterwards. So, um, and this is just briefly to let everybody know, we put this together from the Alliance for Clinical Education to, to reinforce the things that were being um, discussed in the guidebook for clerkship directors. And then also, um, since the book came out about four or five years ago, to give people an update and have um, a broader discussion about what's in there. The Series 101 happened last year, and all those recordings are available on the Alliance for Clinical Education website. Um, and the current ones are well underway. Um, we do have March and April books as well as June, so um, you can look at the website and you'll see the dates for all of those later on. Um, and then next year, we'll be covering these topics, and we'll be getting we'll be starting to work on getting those things lined up probably in the next couple of months. And for those of you who don't know, this is what our guidebook for clerkship directors looks like. And I think I will turn things over now to Dr. Kogan and let her take the lead. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gary, for inviting me to do this. Um, and it, I'm excited to spend the next hour with all of you. And there's a bunch of folks that I recognize. So to those of you that I know personally, hello. Uh, thank you for joining. Before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the co-author of this chapter, Judy Shea. And this talk will be based off of the chapter that we wrote together that focuses on evaluation of clerkship teachers. Next slide, please. So I thought it might just be helpful for me to get a sense of who is joining um, today. And so Gary, I think, has enabled a poll. And if you could just answer, in what capacity are you primarily responsible um, for evaluating clerkship teachers? So are you a, a clerkship or sub-internship director, an administrator, clinical teaching faculty, someone in the dean's office, or other? Great, and I think we have almost everyone. And so it looks like we have actually a really nice um, array of individuals. Um, so we have, um, as you can all see, we have um, many clerkship directors, some administrators, um, many folks from the Dean's office, and then we have a good chunk that are other. And maybe just so I get a sense, if those of you who answered other might just be able to put in the chat kind of what your role is, that would be helpful. And then I think we can stop sharing the poll. No, do we have to share results? <laughs> All right, and um, let's see, maybe some of our others. So administration of evaluations, faculty <laughs> development, great, faculty affairs, excellent. All right, um, if we could go to the next slide. Great, and then next question, um, what clerkship or clerkships are you affiliated with? I think you may only be able to pick one answer. So we've all got all the clerkships. If you're involved with more than one, you can answer I and J is for other. So let's enable that poll. Why is that launching? Hmm. 
Ah, what's going on? It's not letting me launch it. Sorry about that. Oh, Jenna. okay. It's giving me problems. Should we keep going then? Yes, or people can put it in the chat. Yeah, maybe like folks want to put in the chat which one you are. So we have many individuals who are involved in more than one clerkship. We've got some medicine, PEDS, psych, other. So we, the bottom line is we've got a little bit of everybody, which is perfect. And just to know, we do have, oh, there we go. Yeah. A lot of experts in the room. And so hopefully um, as we go through the slides, we can also make this a bit interactive. All right, great. Big showing from neurology today. Excellent. All right, if we could go forward, Gary. Yep. Okay, and then the last uh, question for right now, um, many of you look like you have a lot of expertise um, in evaluation and assessment. And I know many of you recognizing your names have been in medical education for quite a while. And so what is it that you hope to get out of um, today's talk? And if you could put that in the chat, if there's something that you in particular were hoping to get out of today. Okay. All right. That's really helpful. Um, hopefully we can touch base on some of these things. Gary, if you could advance us to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, my objectives for this hour are that my hope is that by the end of this, um, you'll be able to list why um, we should be evaluating clerkship teachers. Um, you'll be able to identify who should be evaluated, um, determine what types of teaching should be evaluated, um, explain how teachers can be evaluated, which I think was a common thread in what you're hoping to get out of the session today. Um, and as well to share with you a little bit about what to do with evaluations once they've been collected. Next slide. So let me just start um, with just a slide or two on why we should be evaluating clerkship teachers. Next slide. So in part, um, <laughs> as many things, it is required by the LCME. And I just put in two of the standards that are focused on evaluation of clerkship teachers. Um, one is 8.3, that faculty of a medical school are responsible for the evaluation of a course of clerkship and teacher quality, um, as well as 8.5 in evaluating the medical education program quality, a medical school has formal processes in place to collect and consider medical student evaluations of their courses, their clerkships, and their teachers. Um, but in addition to doing it because we have to, um, it's also important for us to evaluate clerkship teachers because it serves as a way to provide feedback to those individuals who are responsible for the clerkship, whether that's the clerkship director, the dean's office, and it can be used for continuous quality improvement. And I saw somebody put that in the chat. 
Um, it also provides feedback to clerkship teachers um, as a source of external information about how they're doing. Many of our institutions use these evaluations as part of faculty reappointment, promotion, and tenure. Um, although I think some institutions are also expanding how to assess teaching beyond just student evaluations of clerkship teachers. Um, and then as we look at the evaluations that clerkship teachers are getting, um, it can inform what at an institutional level we should be thinking about in terms of faculty development initiatives. So for example, if there is a theme in many of the evaluations about learners not feeling like they're getting specific or actionable feedback, um, the institution could then have a programming to address that. Next slide, please. All right, if we can enable the poll, um, this asks who has authority for how clerkship teachers are evaluated at your institution? And so in some schools, the clerkship director can decide who's getting evaluated. They can decide what the forms are. They can decide when how reports are created. Um, at other places that's done at the departmental level, um, other places it's done at the school level. In some places there's a hybrid and maybe some of you have no idea um, or there's some other way. So take a minute and let's just see who at your institutions is responsible for all of this. All right, so um, we didn't have everybody who responded, but it looks like just looking at the results of the poll, um, it looks like um, for the majority of individuals, the authority lies at the level of the school. And I see some individuals also using in the chat, like a curriculum committee. Um, there are a small group of people where it's the clerkship director and or the department um, and a few where there is hybrid. All right, let's talk a little bit about this. Next slide. So as we talk about like how to evaluate clerkship teachers, I just wanted to have a slide in here that just identifies the fact that for those of you, for example, who are clerkship directors, um, and as we talk about who should get evaluated and how should they get evaluated and what forms should you use, um, these may be decisions that are not actually under your control. And so it's really helpful to figure out who has the authority to decide who is it that gets evaluated? Um, what is it that you actually can evaluate? Um, what are the mechanisms by which these evaluations are gonna happen? And then what happens to the evaluations? Who gets to see them? Who gets to review them? Um, and so it is useful, I think, to figure out who that is. Um, I know at our institution, it is for the most part done centrally by our Office of Evaluation and Assessment. Um, and the nice part is that there is a staff that helps to think about this and is responsible for you know, delivering all of these evaluations. Um, and with some similarity between clerkships, um, and it does enable some benchmarking, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. Next slide. <clears throat> so let's um, move on to who should be evaluated. So <clears throat> there are many individuals who teach clerkship students. Um, the one that I think we usually think of first are faculty, but many of our students are taught by fellows and residents. Um, increasingly, as we have more advanced practice providers, um, they may be providing um, education, as well as individuals as, who are members of the interprofessional team. And so just one practical tip as you think about who are the individuals that should be evaluated, it can be helpful to just look at the student's schedules, um, which can then help you to identify all of the individuals who the students may be interacting with that may then be evaluated. Next slide. 
All right, so what types of teaching should be evaluated? Next slide. I think the first thing we often think about for clerkship teaching is the clinical teaching that's happening in the hospital um, or in the office. But there are other components of the clerkships as all of you are familiar with. And so it's also important to evaluate the teaching that happens as part of lectures, as part of small groups, if you have simulation um, in your clerkships. Um, those are also types of teaching that you want to think about evaluating. And again, the practical tip is that, you know, just looking at the student schedules um, is a way to identify kind of what teaching is happening. Next slide. All right, um, so this is where the bulk of this talk really is focused on how should we be evaluating teachers. Next slide. So there are multiple modalities um, that can be used to evaluate teachers. We're gonna spend the most time talking about student evaluations of teachers. And I think those are the ones that when we think about how to evaluate clerkship teachers, the evaluations that students complete is typically the one that first comes to mind. But I saw in the chat um, that individuals are interested in, are there other ways that we might be able to evaluate teachers beyond just the evaluations that students complete? And so we'll also talk about multi-source feedback, the role of peer assessment, self-assessment, OSTEs or objective structure teaching evaluations, as well as learner outcomes. Next slide. So regardless of the modality that you are picking, um, it is important that when you have an assessment tool that you are selecting instruments that have validity evidence. And I was looking at the schedule of ACE talks that there have been, and I know that there was a talk um, earlier on thinking about um, validity and assessment. But you want to ideally pick a tool that has some validity evidence associated with it. And you want the questions, since the thing that we're measuring is effective teaching, you want the questions to be grounded in what are thought to be the characteristics of effective teaching. Assessment forms may need to be tailored to um, who it is that's being evaluated. So you could imagine that Maybe the questions that you're going to ask about faculty teaching may be different than the questions you want to know about the teaching that a resident does. Or, for example, if you have nurses or social workers who are interacting with students, it's going to be a different set of questions. So the form has to be tailored to who is being evaluated. It's also important to look at the questions to make sure that they're relevant to the different contexts in which clerkship education is happening. So there may be questions that make a lot of sense on a surgery rotation or in the hospital that maybe don't make as much sense in an ambulatory setting. The questions may also need to be adjusted based on the type of teaching that is being evaluated. So you could imagine that clinical teaching um, may have questions around elaboration of clinical reasoning, um, ability to teach history and or physical exam, um, ability to provide feedback, which would be less relevant in the context of a lecture. Um, and then the assessor who is being asked to complete this evaluation may also impact um, the tool that you are selecting. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. As we think about kind of what questions we want to ask, there are many elements of effective teaching, um, but one of the important things to recognize is that, you know, individuals need to fill out these forms. It takes time. Everybody's busy. And so you always want to consider balancing the length of the form with the feasibility um, of people being willing to complete it. Next slide. So student evaluations of teachers, as I mentioned, are probably the most common ways in which our clerkship teachers are evaluated. So I'm going to spend a few slides talking about this. So um, as many of you know, um, student evaluations of teaching tend to be forms that have a list of questions rated on a scale. So, you know, attributes of teaching rated on some type of scale that may or may not have behavioral anchors. 
and then typically a place where a student can write narrative comments. And that narrative box may just be a, tell us what you think. It may be what were this individual strengths and then a space for opportunities for improvement. Um, there's a pretty robust literature on student evaluations of teaching and in general, they are felt to be reliable and valid. Though importantly, if you are using student evaluations of teaching to make a high stakes decision, for example, um, promoting a promotion decision, you need at least eight of these to make a high stakes decision around the quality of teaching. Um, there's literature that looks at how well these evaluations correlate with outcomes. Um, and there's you know, studies to show that recent graduates um, believe that the amount of learning that they had or their performance um, is associated with the quality of teaching. Um, student evaluations of teaching correlate with peer assessment um, as well as self-assessment. You know, and now that we deliver these electronically, um, it's fairly economical. Um, and in the guidebook, there is a reference to an article that has um, a, uh, that is a comprehensive review of uh, available evaluation instruments. Next slide. Um, on this slide, I'm not gonna read them all, but these are just some forms that have been used that have validity evidence um, with them. Um, and then I see a question in the chat, I think Gary from you, how do you discuss customizing evaluations with an evaluation assessment office that does not want to have multiple forms. Um, is that something, Gary, that you have encountered just to put you on the spot? Um, yes, it is. And um, because I, I agree with you that I think that it's important to, to have evaluation tools that are appropriate for the context. Yeah. But I've dealt with offices and I'm hoping that mine at the new school that I'm at, since I had it up, we're not going to do that. But I know that that does happen because of some of the assessment offices want to have consistency across the board. Yes. So how would you approach talking to them about that? Yeah, has anybody successfully navigated that at their institution where you need to kind of adjust forms for different um, situations and or um, different teachers who are being assessed that you could share your experience? Seems like we have a lot of non-adjusting. Um, yeah, so I mean, I know at our institution, um, we similarly have like one or two forms. There are differences in the forms for like residents as teachers versus faculty as teachers. Um, and we don't collect as much that as we will talk about soon in terms of multi-source feedback. But I wonder as we begin to think about some of the limitations of students' evaluation of teaching, because it gives important information, but it's not the only information that is useful. Um, whether there are ways that institutions might have even like one additional form for like members of the interprofessional team. I guess the other thing that I'm just thinking about as you raise this question, Gary, is that a lot of, um, evaluations of teaching and the specific questions that are on there, if you do like a factor analysis, they all so highly correlate that oftentimes people are just rating like overall teaching effectiveness. And so maybe the answer is just fewer questions given that these discriminating questions maybe don't discriminate so much. They're helpful for feedback, um, but when you sort of look at them, um, many people, they all like load on a single factor. And Ingrid, I did actually in preparation for this talk, try to look up some articles and the fluid article, you're right, is from um, like 2010. And um, it's interesting, there's not a whole lot that's new that I, I was able to find. All right, next slide. Um, 
And then, you know, there are, depending on where you're teaching, the domains of what is going to be assessed may be different. These are common domains that are often assessed for clinical teaching. And then next slide. These are some of the domains that are um, assessed for classroom evaluations. And then, Monica, I saw that you put in the chat a question about bias. Um, in evaluations, and I don't have a slide on it, but I'm really glad that you brought it up and it's probably worth a pause to see what different institutions are doing. I know for us, we have started to look, we, we obviously have started to look at bias in the evaluations that people complete of students, um, but we also look at bias related to faculty. And so we have looked at whether there is, and there is bias in the numerical ratings and then we've used natural language processing um, to also address bias in the narrative comments. Um, and it is not uncommon to find pretty gendered words um, around particularly like female um, attendings or women who identify in faculty who identify as, as women um, in their evaluations. And I think we're seeing more in the literature around bias in evaluations. Are there other um, other um, ways that individuals are exploring bias in the evaluations that students complete of teachers? So some of it, so Jen, thanks. And, and actually the higher ed literature is where this is ripe um, in terms of this and it's, you know, gendered uh, rate. So actually the same bias we see in our grades for students, we see in our <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Of, of faculty. And I think the real issue here is showing the data back to the, the students about what they did. So we found like, as they've been demanding us, show us the data about race, ethnicity, and gender, we've said, okay, now we show back, like we just had an incident where, um, uh, you know, we have honor societies or whatnot, and and at the students' behest, where the students have full control and they're they're missing segments of the population. Um, they didn't give any awards to women. Like some of this is actually showing back the data that you know, and it's actually been helpful on the grading side because it, it hits home that these are in, in, implicit, right? Like because right, the very people who I think feel most strong and appropriately activated around this issue are actually in some ways doing the same things. And I think when we do this around grading committees and stuff that we do for our faculty, I think we're forgetting to do it for the students. I, I love that we have not done that, but I um, we certainly similarly have been very pressed by our students to look at the bias and the evaluation of learners. And I really like um, the idea of sharing it the other direction. Is anybody else doing that? I think we're going to start doing that. I'm going to talk to our Office of Evaluation and Assessment. All right, let's 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 move on. Um, this is just uh, some domains for residents um, as teachers. Next slide. Um, so here are some of the decisions that need to be made when you're thinking about how students are going to evaluate teachers. So particularly for things like small groups and lecturing, you have to decide if all of your learners are going to be evaluating all events or whether you want to have sampling. And it's an important thing to think about just because um, our learners can oftentimes be very burdened with the number of evaluations that we ask them to complete. Um, and so, you know, if you have 150 students that are going to the same lecture, you might not need all of them. If you're gonna do sampling though, it's important that um, it is sort of random sampling and it's not just when students choose to evaluate something or not, because they're obviously maybe bias and who um, decides what it is they are evaluating. Given that many of our students um, work with, you know, few teachers and teachers only are attending a few times a year, um, we usually avoid sampling when it comes to the evaluation of like clinical teaching. 
Um, the second thing you have to think about is whether evaluations of teachers are voluntary um, or if they're mandatory. Um, at our institution, they are mandatory and students can't actually get their evaluations until they've completed um, the evaluations of their teachers. You need to decide if your evaluations are anonymous. So that means like nobody would be able to figure out the student who evaluated a particular faculty member. Confidential, like the clerkship director and the faculty member don't know, but there is a person in the Office of Assessment who could link the evaluation back to an individual or are the evaluations that students complete of learners signed. Um, you have to think about the timing, like are people rating things right away after the lecture or are they doing it at the end of a clerkship block? Um, and can learners see um, their grade before completing evaluations? And then just practically, you also need to think about um, how do you adjust for when a lecturer changes or, you know, in the past three years, somebody gets COVID and can't ward attend. So how do you monitor to make sure that you're updating the evaluations when there are schedule changes? So let's talk a little bit more about anonymous, confidential, and, and signed. Next slide. I think we have a poll. When your students complete evaluations of clinical teachers, are they signed? So you can see the student's name. Confidential, there is a person who can link it back. Um, anonymous, meaning nobody could be able to link this evaluation back to the student. It depends, and I have no idea. Great, and so we have, well, there's still some coming in. Well, I think we can maybe um, end the poll. It looks like we have a majority who have voted. Um, it looks like we're largely evenly split between confidential and anonymous with slightly more um, individuals who use confidential evaluations, though there is a very small group where um, they are signed. Um, so let's keep going. And Gary, this is two clicks. Poorly timed animation. <laughs> um, so here's just a chart that kind of takes you through the pros and cons of evaluation types and the red box is around confidential because confidential evaluations can kind of help you to bridge some of the pros and cons between signed evaluations and anonymous. And so I'll kind of focus on the confidential um, side. So, um, you know, students concerns, um, students are very worried about being identified. Um, and then everything that comes with that, um, particularly in you know, the hierarchy that they perceive. Um, so anonymous evaluations you know, are helpful because students are less worried about being identified. That said, even if you tell students they are anonymous, they still don't believe you and they still are worried that there is some way that um, they will be identified. Um, you know, when students, when they're signed or even confidential, because students know that their name is attached to it, they tend to be you know, a little bit more careful in what they're writing, but they similarly may be less candid. That's generosity error. Um, you're more likely to see the unprofessional comments, but potentially some more true or candid comments when the evaluations are anonymous. Um, when you have confidential or signed evaluations, if somebody writes really unprofessional comments, um, there's a way to track down the student. You can track down non-responders. You know, and if there's a student who writes something about a clerkship teacher that is, you know, really egregious or concerning, you aren't able to follow up on that if it's anonymous, whereas you can if it's signed or confidential. And so. Um, we at our institution, we use confidential. We hope that it sort of strikes that balance between getting candid assessments. It enables us to follow up when there are unprofessional comments, and it does enable us to follow up if a student writes something that's really concerning. Next slide, please. 
Um, when I, I'm no longer a clerkship director, but when I was a clerkship director, I realized that it was important to coach students about either anonymity or confidentiality and to kind of explain to them how the evaluation system works. They are very, very concerned about um, evaluations coming back to haunt them or limiting their future opportunities. Um, and so I used to, you know, during clerkship orientation or at some point during the clerkship, uh, you know, didactics, would go over with our students that, you know, our evaluations are confidential. Um, I would go over who's the individual who gets to see like their name attached. Um, and then I would talk about how you can fill out an evaluation that protects your anonymity. Um, and I would say, you know, if you write um, in a confidential evaluation, you know, when I was at the VA in March um, on the pulmonary service, you have de-identified yourself. And so, um, you know, telling them to leave out those details um, to discuss the teaching attribute, but potentially leaving out specific examples if they really want to remain more anonymous. Um, and then the other thing that's really important um, is that if students think that they're, even if the evaluations are confidential and or anonymous, if students think that a faculty member is going to get this evaluation within a month or two of working with the student, it doesn't matter that it's confidential or anonymous because they the faculty member would link it to the student. So it's helpful that um, you go over with students that you don't release any evaluations until a given faculty member has a minimum number of evaluations. Um, sharing with students that when faculty see their evaluations, they are de-identified and aggregated, um, so it can't be linked back. And so what this means is that somebody who's new to an institution and is new to teaching and doesn't teach maybe more than you know a few blocks a year, it may take them two years before they actually start to get their teaching evaluations, again, as a way to protect students' anonymity. Next slide, please. Um, we do not have longitudinal integrated clerkships at Penn, but as I was putting this talk together, and we didn't really address it in the book chapter, but many institutions are now having more longitudinal integrated clerkships, you know, where a student is working with one or two faculty members over time. And it made me wonder this whole idea of anonymity, how possible that is if you are in a longitudinal clerkship um, and you're working with a single faculty. I don't know how you make that um, anonymous. And so I actually reached out to um, a colleague at UCSF who does have longitudinal integrated clerkships to find out how they think about this. Um, and what I learned from them, and if any of you have longitudinal clerkships, I'd be interested in hearing how you think about this issue of, you know, protecting the student but needing evaluations of the faculty. Um, there they do, students evaluate the faculty um, quarterly. Um, they sort of recognize the difficulty with anonymity and they kind of coach students to help them to word corrective feedback when it needs to be given. Um, and their experience at least has been that students are willing to write corrective feedback and maybe um, it's a sign of the relationship that students have with the faculty. Um, as we think about some of the research that's come out of longitudinal integrated clerkships that show that you know, faculty are more willing to give students feedback and students are more receptive to it in these longitudinal relationships because you know there's credibility and there's trust. Perhaps it works bi-directionally. Um, but is there anybody on the call who has a longitudinal integrated clerkship and would like to share how you have thought about the balance of protecting students' anonymity with the fact that they're working with a single faculty member? Um, hi, Elise Everett here with UVM. I, we do similarly to what you described with our LIC. Um, I guess we we try, I guess, not to use the word anonymous. We use the word confidential, yeah. um, but they are essentially anonymous. Although if there was something really horrific, like a threat to a faculty or something like that, they would be, they are able to be de-identified. Um, so, 
you know, but again, in the longitudinals, we do exactly what you said, which is to clump them quarterly to really work on um, the language uh, that's used. And I think you're right, the relationship that forms between the student and the faculty member is much more likened to a coach and they seem much more willing to have a positive bi-directional feedback loop mm -hmm. um, than, you know, um, when you're in a block clerkship and you just spend a half a day with someone. And then I see Ingrid wrote in the chat that um, the clerkship directors collect the feedback from the students, aggregate it for the faculty. There's a little bit of data loss, but it is more palatable and protects students. So that's another strategy. Great. Maybe we'll move on to the next slide then. All right, so um, I have less slides for each of these other um, types of evaluation, but we'll just talk a minute about multi-source feedback. Next slide. So multi-source feedback is where there are multiple individuals with different relationships to the teacher who are asked to evaluate the teacher. We've already talked about learner evaluations of teachers. There are other individuals who could be used, um, teaching experts, peers, um, nurses, and self-assessment is considered part of multi-source feedback. Um, it is important, similar to what we talked about earlier, that there need to be an adequate number of evaluations per group to maintain anonymity, as well as to make um, assessments where you can draw some valid uh, conclusions from it. So, you know, it is no longer de-identified if there's one person um, who is a teaching expert and one person who's a nurse. Next slide. Um, similar to what we've discussed, um, multi-source feedback assessment forms, ideally you want to choose ones that have some validity evidence. Um, this gets back to the idea that we talked about earlier. The recommendation when doing this is that different assessor groups um, do have different items and scales if, um, in order to be relevant. Um, that the raters must be knowledgeable about the teaching behaviors and importantly, that they're not rating clinical acumen, they're rating um, teaching. Um, and they should have an idea of what is considered effective teaching. And then the items on the form should be behaviors or skills that an, an evaluator can rate. So if let's say you're having maybe a nurse fill out an evaluation of a clerkship teacher, if on that form there's something about how much the faculty member gives feedback, um, if they're never watching the faculty member give feedback, it's not something they can rate. Next slide, please. Um, peer assessment, which is a form of multi-source feedback, um, is a really nice way to think about the evaluation of clerkship teachers. Next slide. Um, peers are usually defined as somebody who is at the same level of training or expertise. This is not somebody who has authority um, over the clerkship teacher. They have the same hierarchical status. And so you know, the, I think the most common example of this is when like a faculty member watches another faculty member um, on rounds, or perhaps if you have a residence as teachers program, um, you know, a resident will watch another resident uh, teaching. Um, teaching, peer assessment of teaching can either be assessment of live teaching, um, or it could be of recorded teaching. Um, but the context probably influences whether you want to do live um, assessment or recorded assessment. So, you know, if you're observing lectures, that works pretty well, whether you're doing it live in person or watching something recorded. You know, small groups, you can lose a lot if you're watching a recording of small groups, though it's possible. And then it's pretty hard to think about, particularly with HIPAA, how you would really record um, live clinical teaching. So that um, clinical teaching assessment really needs to be done live. A nice piece of recorded um, peer observation is that the teacher themselves can actually review their teaching. And although it is very painful to watch a video recording of yourself teaching, it is usually very illuminating after you get past what your voice sounds like and all of your weird, like, you know, oh, I touch my hair, I move my hands a lot. It's hard to look at it, but it is really valuable. Um, and then each has its own limitations. You know, um, if you're standing there watching somebody teach, um, they may engage in teaching behaviors that they don't normally. So they may be putting their best foot forward. Um, you know, if it's recorded, sometimes the assessor isn't um, as visible. So the person being um, 
recorded, like forgets that they're, you know, being observed. Um, so it may get to a little bit more authenticity. Um, but then you have to deal with issues around recording quality, whether that's volume or missing nonverbals, being able to see the room. Next slide. So out of curiosity, does anybody um, use peer observation of teaching for your clerkship teachers? Great. So it looks like there actually is a small group that do um, about 20%. Um, um, most folks on the call today um, do not. Next slide. Um, so if you're thinking about doing peer assessment of teaching, you need to think about like who are going to be the peer assessors? How are they chosen? Um, is this something that is like mandatory or optional? Um, what teaching domains are going to be assessed? Um, you know, are you going to be doing peer observation of lectures? Are you going to be doing peer observation of clinical teaching? That will impact the forms that you're using. Um, there needs to be some shared understanding of like what is effective teaching and individuals are going to want to know how this information um, gets used. There are some um, existing forms. Um, I have done peer observation of lecturing um, and um, frequently use um, the form by Newman that is on this slide. Um, this form is nice because it actually has some behavioral anchors, which I think really help to um, see the spectrum of a particular skill. Um, if peer assessment is being used as part of like a faculty dossier for reappointment or for promotion, it is important to recognize you need a minimum of 11 evaluations to have a reliability coefficient of, of 0.7. So, um, you know, oftentimes people think about using this in conjunction with student evaluations of teachers. Um, but to recognize that like having one or two of these and then using that for a high stakes decision um, isn't really justified. Next slide. Um, you probably will get the most out of the program if you do some peer training of the observers. Um, and some of the components of that are, you know, avoiding interference. So like you're observing, you're not teaching, so keep your mouth shut. Um, how to give feedback, how to maintain confidentiality, and, you know, how to make this um, not a judgmental experience, but a formative um, experience. And um, Newman et al. Um, published a study showing that um, if you do some rater training, that you actually can increase the um, agreement around the assessment of teaching quality. Next slide. So here are just some pros and cons of peer observation. Um, you know, many faculty have a lot of knowledge about what are optimal teaching behaviors. Um, peers then are actually watching teaching and you can get a two for one. They can suggest curricular changes. Um, we use this a lot in um, pediatrics here at Penn. And what we have heard is that the experience is as beneficial for the person who's being observed as the individual who's doing the observing. The individual who's observing gets to see another way that faculty teaches and they usually pick up some teaching strategies as well. Um, you know, it encourages reflection. It can be used for promotion. Obviously, it takes time. Um, if you're gonna do it, um, there should be some preparation of peers. Um, and it's important to think about who the peers are because similar to when we think about how our learners want feedback, um, individuals are not going to find this assessment credible or trustworthy if they don't feel that the person who is observing them is qualified or credible. All right, next slide. All right, self-assessment, just briefly. Um, it is helpful to have our teachers um, evaluate themselves. Next slide. Um, you know, teachers can identify their own learning needs and then create an action plan to address that. Um, Self-assessment 
um, works the best when it is facilitated, meaning that you are sitting down, you are looking at your evaluations, you review them with um, another person, and they help you to identify some of the goals of what it is that you want to work on. Self-assessment can um, also be done by watching videos of your teaching. Um, and again, trying to compare sort of how you think you're doing from what you're seeing in your assessments. Next slide. Um, and this is just the process of self-assessment, which um, is here for you in the slides and I already described. Next slide. Um, wanted to spend a minute or two on OSTEs. Next slide. Um, so these were actually first described in the 1990s and you may be familiar, this is where you have a standardized student who is trained to simulate an authentic teaching challenge. And so it may be around, you know, how does a teacher set a learning climate, teach a procedure, or give feedback? So let's do a quick poll. Next slide. So do you have OSTEs at your institution? Great. And we have a few people who do use them. And I'd love to hear um, maybe briefly from somebody who does have OSTEs, if they could just share how they use them at their institution. Well, maybe if somebody wants to use the chat, why don't we move forward just in the interest of time. Next slide. So um, if you are going to set up an OSTE, um, there are different individuals who can play the role of the standardized student. There are many ways that the teacher can actually get feedback um, about their performance. They can self-assess it. The standardized student can give them feedback. There may be a peer who's watching the interaction who can give feedback, and then there could be the facilitator um, who could give uh, feedback. You know, having yourself out there, like doing um, a standardized case um, can be stressful and anxiety provoking. And so it's just important to think about the environment in which this is done. Um, really sort of sharing with faculty that the idea is that we all have an opportunity to improve. Um, and again, the feedback facilitator um, needs to be somebody that the faculty would find trustworthy and kind of Vegas rules would apply, like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, what happens during the OSTE um, stays in there. Next slide. There is an article that was published in 2012 that's here for your reference that just has the 12 tips for how to um, establish an OSTE. I won't go through this, but it's there for your reference. Next slide. Um, and then just some OSTE pros and cons. It's nice because it, it allows an opportunity to practice. You can have realistic scenarios. There's immediate feedback and debriefing and individuals who go through it find it beneficial. But as you can imagine, it is costly um, to both create the cases, train individuals, um, and there isn't a whole lot of data that it actually improves teaching skills. Next slide. Learner outcomes. Next slide. So the other way to determine teaching effectiveness um, is to aggregate learner performance. And so um, you can aggregate learners' performance um, through their OSCEs or their exams, and then use that as a metric of how effective teaching was. Um, it's challenging. You can do this more at the level of the clerkship. It's a bit challenging to attribute learner outcomes to a particular teacher. Um, because learners don't work with teachers for a long time and there's so many places that they are being educated. But you could imagine that it may be a way um, for students who are have a clerkship as part of a longitudinal integrated clerkship, um, you could imagine that um, that might work. Next slide. All right, so I just have a few slides in the last minute. Next slide. Um, think about how you're gonna clean the data 
whether unprofessional comments will be edited, um, whether outlier ratings will be addressed, and how you'll follow up on evaluation concerns. Next slide. You need to think about whether you're going to have benchmarks. Um, so, like, are you going to have faculty have a comparison group, like the faculty gets their rating, and then do they get the ratings of other faculty? And if they do, is it like all faculty in the institution? Is it faculty within their department? Um, are there going to be standards of like you need to hit a certain bar? Um, and if faculty don't hit that bar or residents don't hit that bar, um, what happens next? How does that impact promotions? Um, and then just another important thing is as you're looking at the evaluation data, I think it's important to remember that not all of the teaching, um, it's just based on faculty's teaching skill, right? Like imagine if there are incredibly busy services where the volume of patients is astronomical, like that context is important to what faculty are able to do. And so just to remember that faculty evaluations can be impacted by the context in which they're teaching. Next slide. I think this is one of my last slides. So just data security is really important. Um, where are you gonna keep your evaluations? Um, how do you keep them private? And really importantly, who gets to see them? Um, this is sort of faculty's data, and it is not uncommon that people, when they're um, looking for somebody for a new role, may ask, like, can I see how this faculty member is doing? And so you need to have some clear policies around who is able to see the data. Next slide. Um, and then distributing reports. Um, you know, do reports get distributed right away? It's nice because if you sort of share the information right away, people can pivot and make changes, but then people can overemphasize random fluctuations and it can be timely. When you delay, again, you can protect anonymity, but it's really helpful at a minimum to think about when are the times that one would make changes in a clerkship and making sure that evaluations are released in time to be able to make those changes. Next slide. So take home points. Um, remember that the teachers in a clerkship are more than just the faculty, um, that you want to assess teaching effectiveness in multiple different contexts, um, either finding tools with validity evidence or collecting validity evidence for the tools that you're using. Um, think about some of these other sources of assessment. Um, think about the pros and cons of confidentiality and anonymity and then making decisions about how the evaluations will be used. So I think that is it. I know we're kind of at time, but I am happy to stick on for a few minutes if folks have questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Elise Everett here from UVM. Sorry to join late. My case went a little longer than expected. Um, one of the things we're really struggling with here is um, something you mentioned in your last few slides was around um, that evaluation that maybe shouldn't be in the file. Um, and, you know, they can have a huge impact on faculty promotion and reappointment and things like that. Um, and we haven't really here um, come up with a way to address that. So I'm just curious if you have an example of one way that your institution or someone else's has done that. Yeah, we have a mechanism. We get our evaluations as faculty twice a year. And then when you get it, there is a place that you actually can go in you as the faculty. And if you have like an issue with what was said or whatnot, you can like let them know and then they will look into it. And then if there are central team actually reads everything they like scan all of it and if there is something that is really unprofessional not grounded they actually remove it does that answer at least your question so there's sort of two mechanisms i mean our evaluation office spends hours upon hours reading all of these comments before faculty see them and kind of clean it a little bit okay. um, and faculty have the ability to say, whoa, this is like not fair. So you have a way for them to provide context or their side of the quote unquote yeah. story, if you will. And then 
um, it sounds like some centralized committee, like a professionalism team or something that um, you can go through a process to have it removed. Yeah, I mean, um, if, if you know somebody says you're rude and arrogant and it comes up on six evaluations, right. you may actually be doing something that makes people think you're rude and arrogant. But when it's like really out of left field, the other thing that um, happens is sometimes we have um, what are called educational officers who are like within each of the departments. And sometimes there is a contextual thing, like all of the students really hated the course on, I don't know, epidemiology. And so the ratings are really low, but it has nothing to do with the teacher. It really had to do with students' perceptions of this class. And when faculty go up for reappointment and promotion in the dossier, the educational officer will write about that. Lou had a good question. Lou always has good questions. Um, has anyone put a dollar on the a dollar figure on the cost of effective evaluation? I don't know the answer. Lou, do you have a thought about that? Uh, no, Jen, I'm sorry. I don't have a thought about it. Um, I knew that as chair of medicine, I was spending a fair amount of money on it or faculty time to do it. <clears throat> It's like most of the things we do in assessment, whether it's in residence of students or of teachers, we do it as a matter of policy, not as a matter of, with an evidence base yeah. uh, value added. We do it because we think we should. Yeah, we just changed. We're piloting now for our prom for our promotion process for faculty um, led by uh, Jessica Dine um, and kind of you, I think based off of um, in part what like UCSF does and their kind of academy of educators. The teaching evaluations are still part of the database, but faculty have to sort of now when they go up for promotion, they have to talk about like what is their teaching philosophy? What do they believe their impact has been in teaching and like is your impact in clinical teaching is your impact on um, like administration within medical education? Is it in research in medical education? Um, ways in which you've incorporated feedback and use that to grow and change. Um, and so impact, we're kind of looking not just at, do people like your teaching, but what is the impact of that teaching? And we're yeah. trying to broaden our perspective of it. Sure. Well, Chipper Griffith uh, published some stuff on that almost 20 years ago looking at one set of faculty evaluations by one group of teachers and found that um, those students, um, the people who, the students who had those teachers, strong teachers tend to do better. Yeah. We published a couple of papers showing that people who use some of the things in the Stanford Faculty Development Program, mm -hmm. Learning Climate Feedback, their growth in terms of multiple choice test and progress and rhyme, both was stronger with teachers who use certain behaviors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it kind of validated some of the Stanford faculty development tenants. I mean, yeah, none of that is cost. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's hard too, I think, because even though there is pretty good data about the relationship between effective teaching behaviors and learner outcomes, my experience has been that faculty don't believe that students um, know what they're doing when they're evaluating their teaching. I don't know if you've had that. Well, we don't use the word evaluations to, to make that point. Yeah. Call them critiques, like course critiques in college, so the teachers don't feel they are being evaluated or judged implicitly, as opposed to an evaluation where faculty are observing faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we try to uh, ameliorate that feeling they get from the negatives. The other thing is we invite, and most students do sign their evaluations because we're trying to teach them how to give feedback. And I'm proud of the fact that although my evaluations tend to be very positive, they often say negative things about me. He's intimidating, he's too old fashioned, et cetera, et cetera. And they write it down. Now, no student ever sees, no, no, no faculty member ever sees their evaluations to all the grading is complete. And you know, our students often work with these people for the next 10 years. So we're proud of the fact that they're willing to give honest feedback in the same way we try to give them honest feedback. You still need something anonymous though, that if there's something they don't wanna write down and we want that immediately, we don't wait for the critiques at the end 
to get that. So there's really two kinds of evaluations of faculty. One is, is like the physiologic monitoring or osmolality or blood sugar. It needs to happen very quickly. If something's going wrong, if there's abuse, you don't want to wait till the end to find out about that. So we use parallel systems. Yeah. So All right. I you. hate to cut you guys off, but sorry, we're having we're, a good time. Here. Past time, and um, I want to be respectful of everybody else. So, but thank you very much, Dr. Coven, for doing this. And we really much, very much appreciate it, and appreciate everybody who came. Um, the recording will be posted by tomorrow morning. So. Um, and I'll send out an email blast to notify everybody about it. Thanks, everyone.